and to receive the Word of God. I'd like to invite you to open up with a prayer, and then we'll give the microphone to our guest speaker, and he'll take over from here. Lord Jesus, we're grateful to be here tonight. We thank you, Lord, that we can come together, and we can learn from you, Lord, and we can apply what we learn into our lives. And that is a blessing, Lord. And we're so grateful for each and every one that is here, Lord. And we ask you, may your spirit guide us, may your spirit help us, Lord, to learn. Open our minds and our hearts today, Lord, that we may receive what you have prepared for us. I ask you to bless Pastor, whatever he's at, Lord. Bless, Lord, his time there. Protect him, Lord. I thank you, Lord. And I remind, I'm asking you for all the saints there who, who could not be here, Lord, for whatever reason. And may your hand be with them, Lord. May you continue working in their lives. And I ask you to bless this word that you have for us, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can put your hands together for the Lord if you love him. Amen. Do I stand by, back here? Okay. Yeah, let's, maybe we'll use that. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Why don't we uh, stand? We're going to take our text tonight very quickly. And um, I want to say once again that it's an honor and a privilege to be here. Um, met a lot of people the past two services. And so i um, trying to keep up with all the names. Um, I might forget your name, but I won't forget your face, I promise. But um, I want to say that um, your pastor has been very kind and has been very gracious toward us, and I appreciate him very much in his absence also, um, keeping him in prayer for safe travels. Can you say amen? The book of Matthew, chapter number 5, verses 13. Matthew 5, verses 13. When you're there, say amen. If you're not there, say hold on. <laughs> All right, Matthew 5, 13 says, Ye are the salt of the earth. Everybody say, that's me. That's me. All right. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Turning very quickly now to the book of Mark, chapter number 9, verses 50. Mark, chapter number 9, verses 50. Mark 9, verses 50 says, Salt is good. And uh, you're probably reading, the, for those of you who are reading this in maybe a print Bible, the words are in red. And that means these are the words of Jesus Christ. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his saltness, wherewith will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves, and have peace one with another. I'm going to preach or teach, preach slash teach. We call that treaching. It's kind of halfway in between. Uh, on the subject for the next few moments of uh, worth your salt. Let's lift our hands as we place our Bibles down and let's begin to pray and ask Jesus to help us. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness, for your mercy. I ask that you would touch us tonight with a special touch of understanding and wisdom. Give us the grace, Lord, to, uh, to, to have with, uh, uh, with meekness to receive the engrafted word of God. Amen. If you're ready to have some church, why don't you clap your hands? <laughs> Hallelujah. God bless you. You can be seated in Jesus' name. The phrase, the salt of the earth, is probably a phrase um, that most of us are familiar with. Even people who don't really read the Bible have at least at some point heard someone use the phrase, the salt of the earth. Um, this phrase is used to describe people that we can perceive as being genuinely good people. You know, we think of someone who's just a good person, and you say, oh, that person is just the salt of the earth. They, they just add a little bit of flavor to, the, to this world. However, the true weight of this phrase is, is a little lost on us um, because the importance of salt in, in our everyday life literally um, has been diminished by technology. What do I mean by that? Um, salt is one of the most essential ingredients for life. Uh, before there were refrigerators, 
almost everybody has a refrigerator, I'm positive. Um, we, have, we have freezers now, we have coolers, we have cans, we have canned food, we have Tupperware, we have dry ice. Before all of that, the only way to preserve food was with salt. You, you couldn't, there was no fridge to open, there was nowhere to go at 3 a.m. in the morning and open several times and close before you find out what you really want. You had to preserve every bit of food with salt. Salt was a preservative and is a preservative. Salt also serves as one of the most time-tested seasonings. And I don't know about you, but um, I'm one of those people that I pour salt on my food. And as I'm pouring, I'm talking, and people are, that I'm talking to are looking at my food. And I'm talking to them, and they're thinking, is he going to stop? I, mean, I don't know. Anybody else like that? I, mean, I like to put salt on my food. Um, and I can guarantee almost everybody here has salt in their home. Almost 100% sure. Somebody, somebody's got some. And so at one point in history, it was the most traded natural resource in the world. And to this day, we have um, unearthed what archaeolog um, archaeologists call salt routes. And these were the routes that salt traders traveled the world. And the outcomes of many ancient wars were in no small part affected simply by which side of the battle had more salt. Sometimes that was a matter, uh, that, that was the difference between winning a war, was which side had more salt, all right? So without salt, food could not be preserved. And if food is not preserved, of course, people don't eat, and people don't eat, they starve. And if they starve, they can't fight. And if you can't fight, you can't defend your civilization. And um, a lot can be lost just for lack of of a little bit of salt. Salt even served as a form of currency in many parts of the world. It wouldn't work now. You can't go to the store and try to buy an iPhone with a bag of salt. It wouldn't work like that. Um, but there was a time where ancient Roman soldiers were sometimes paid in salt or had a portion of their wages designated specifically for the purchase of salt. And so, you know, when you get your check and you see all the deductions, well, an ancient Roman soldier had a deduction, and it was the salt deduction. Amen. And uh, thank God we don't have that one. We get taxed enough already. Well, I'm from California. I don't, I don't know what it's like up here. I'm assuming you guys get taxed, maybe a little less. Um, so this is where we get the modern... Who speaks Spanish here? Anybody speak Spanish? Everybody points over here. <laughs> there he is. What is the word for salt? Sal, S-A-L. The, the fact... You can actually trace the, the etymology of that word to an English word called a salary. Not celery, salary. And that is a salary is what you get paid. And that's, those concepts are linked um, to the, the word salt, literally. Because there was a time when people were paid in salt. And so now people get paid a salary. If a person's labor or quality of work was not worth the wages that they had been paid, the person was referred to as not being worth their salt. Anybody ever heard that phrase? That, that person is not worth their salt. Okay, so that's where these ideas and concepts all kind of come together. There is an estimated 14,000 different uses for salt. So to say that salt was very important and is still very important, would be an understatement. Uh, in fact, um, not too long ago, I, was, um, I came across something on the internet. There was a, there's a specific type of mountain goat. I forget what it's called. But this mountain goat lives in an area where it doesn't have access to very many nutrients and minerals, one of them being salt. And this goat can, out of sheer necessity, will climb an almost vertical wall a vertical wall to find a little stream of salt that's leaking out of uh, the, the crack of a mountain. Have you seen that? Yeah. And they will, they, will, they will climb it and they will risk their lives for just a few little licks of salt off of this rock. And so this is extremely, extremely important in nature and in life. And um, anybody who's ever been to the hospital and maybe you've been dehydrated or for whatever reason, you know that there's saline solution. And that is, once again, so, so, um, so once again, there's so many uses for this. And 
in our text, Jesus kind of makes it all very, very simple. He sums it up by saying, salt is good. We can all say with uh, some confidence tonight that salt is good, all right? Um, and to be the salt of the earth, to be the salt of the earth is to be one of the best things that you could be. But, but what, is, what, is exa- what, is it, what does that exactly mean? What is Jesus really telling us? Uh, when he's asking us to be the salt of the earth. In simple terms, he's asking us to be the realest, best Christians that we can possibly be. To be worth our salt in the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter number 5 brings us to what many people consider the most memorable sermon ever preached. The Sermon on the Mount. And surrounded by his closest disciples and the casually curious, Jesus delivers uh, what some people refer to as the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Very beautiful part of scripture. And he's giving us a list of attributes. The Sermon on the Mount describes the traits that, that define the truest and most devoted lovers of God. Uh, he reminds us that if we are poor in, poor in spirit, if we mourn, if we are meek, if we are hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Anybody hungry and thirsty for righteousness? If we are merciful, if we are pure in heart, if we are peacemakers, and if we are persecuted, that there is a blessing for us on earth and a reward waiting in heaven. Amen. Jesus then makes the interesting statement that those who bear these traits now We're jumping into the text that we read. Those who bear these traits are indeed the salt of the earth. And then reminds us that one of the most hopeless situations is to have salt that isn't salty. He talks about when salt loses its saltness. Situations. Um... I don't know about you, but I want, to, I want to be the best Christian I can be. I want, to, I want to be the best person and the best disciple of Jesus that I can be. I don't want to be salt that has lost its salt. All right? And Jesus then says, if evil men throw out salt that has lost its saltness, what would then, the, the, the concept here is, if, if a human with, with very simple basic standards of excellence, if the average person in the marketplace, if they were to buy some salt and they took it home and they put it on their chicken or their steak or whatever, and it didn't salt their food, what would they do with it? What would the average person do? They would throw it away. They would, they would just throw it out because it, it has no use. And this is very, very sobering when you really think about what Jesus is implying here. And that is there are things that look like salt, that have the texture of salt that um, have been marketed as salt. But when you put them to test, they're not really salt. And, and the average person would throw it out. Now what, now what would God do with someone who advertised themselves as a Christian? I mean, looked like a Christian, but deep down inside was deceiving all others. Amen. It makes you really think about what it will cost to be the truest and realest Christian that you could possibly be. Anybody feel challenged to, to say, you know, I want to be my best? Can you say amen? I mean, I want to be worth my salt. Number one, salt is an enhancer. In Leviticus 2, verses 13, God commands that all animal sacrifices be salted to taste. Now, this I find this very interesting because... Um, God is invisible. God is a spirit. God doesn't eat barbecue. Amen. God doesn't eat carne asada. Amen. I think a sister before service mentioned carne asada, I think. Amen. It's on my mind. Amen. Why would God ask in the Old Testament, now this is, now this is Levitical law, this is before the New Testament, so animal sacrifices were still ritual in the temple. Why would he ask the Levites to salt a sacrifice that was essentially going to be burned on an altar? Amen. That is because, number one, we know God doesn't eat. But why would he do this? The point, is not that, the, the point is not that God eats. The point is God doesn't want anything sacrificed to him that doesn't even appeal to your senses. Why would I, get, why would I give God something that I wouldn't even care for? Some, some people find, you know, um, 
So it's not sacrifice unless, it, unless it's something that you value and appeals to your, your own sensibilities. And so when you come into the house of God, you have to give God something that you yourself find valuable. Amen. And um, it's, not, it's not real worship if it's not a hand clap that you wouldn't enjoy for yourself. Amen. It's not real work. You know, <clears throat> if your favorite football team gets more of a hand clap, amen, and more shouting from you than, than Jesus does, that's... That's unsalted praise right there. You need to sprinkle some salt on that. <laughs> Amen. You need, to, you need to put something on there that will make it valuable and appealing even to you. And then you need to offer it to God. I want to give God my best praise when I show up to church. Uh, Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to give God my very best. Uh, Amen. If we wouldn't want it, why, why would we give it to God? Amen. That, that would be a careless and a bland sacrifice. Uh, Amen. And God doesn't want a bland praise. Amen. you got to sprinkle some salt on that. You, want, you have to make sure that when you praise, uh, you put effort into it. It's not just habitual. It's not just routine. It's not something that you do because other people are doing. But you have put effort into it. Amen. Salt is not just an enhancer, but as, as we discussed already, it is a preservative. Uh, later in Numbers 18, verses 19, God makes a covenant with his people. And... This covenant or this promise between him and his people is sealed with salt. Meaning he made a promise and then after that he commanded that the, that, that covenant would be sealed with salt. Now why is that significant? Amen. Um, if, you know, when we're kids we, we do this thing. We make pinky promises and somehow it makes everything all, you know, for sure, Right. And that's, that's children's way of communicating that, you know, things are, it's going to get done. And then when you get older, you know, you, you start signing things. You put your name on it, and that, you, you seal whatever that is, whether it's a check or uh, it doesn't matter what it is. When you sign your name on it, you are, you are guaranteeing it. And um, God had them do something very interesting. He made a promise, and then he had them sprinkle, sprinkle salt. And what he was saying when... By, by, by having this covenant sealed with salt, is that I am making you a promise that will never expire. Amen. And when God makes promises, let me tell you something. Amen. He doesn't make them lackadaisically. He doesn't just, God is not flippant. God is not a man that he should lie. Amen. When God promises something to you, he sprinkles salt on it. And that's his way of saying that this is good. I'm good for this. Uh, amen. This will be preserved. Uh, let me remind you that if God has ever given you a dream or a promise uh, or has ever spoken to you clearly in prayer and you've yet to see that come to fruition, let me remind you that we serve a God who keeps his promises. Uh, amen. He will never fail you. He will never forsake you. He will never leave you. He will be with you even until the ends of the earth. Uh, he makes a promise that will not rot, uh, that will not decay with time. It will be preserved for generations to come. Can you say amen? Salt is extremely important in the biblical context, not just in the natural world, as we can see. Uh, God makes promises, and he, he takes his promises very seriously. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 20. For all the promises of God in him are yea and amen unto the glory of God by us. God keeps his promises. Amen. So keep your promises to him. Amen. He's faithful to us, so we are faithful to him. He's never failed you. Never fail him. Do your best uh, to serve him with everything that you have. Uh, you are the salt of the world. You are the preservative of the world. Uh, amen. We, we, we understand that God is asking us to take on the traits of salt as Christians in the world. And we are also called, amen, to be a preservative, amen, in the world. What does that mean? The gospel uh, and God has always given people to have the power to preserve. What do I mean by that? Amen. Salt is very, very powerful in that it doesn't take a whole lot of it to get the job done. One pinch of salt can, can preserve a whole lot. And um, we read in our Bible from the very, very opening chapters that there are, there are individuals. That they don't have a whole lot. They don't have all, all, um, all of these things at their disposal. But we, we read of a man by the name of Noah who was able to preserve the life of his family. And in so doing, he saves the life of many other people. Um, one man 
young man by the name of Joseph. Just one little pinch of salt. God uses him to save his family and consequently an entire nation. Exodus uh, brings us the story of two midwives. In fact, you know, we think the story of Exodus is about Moses. In fact, it, it opens up with a story of two midwives who save the lives of, of these children. And ultimately, they save the lives of of the, the life of Moses, who in turn saves an entire nation. It, it took just a little bit, just, a, just one or two people in some cases, to save millions of people. And sometimes we, we get discouraged as to how effective that we can be. Remember, you are the salt of the, of the earth. You can be effective. Amen. Just one person. In some cases, amen, can, can lead so many people to salvation. Never underestimate the power of just a pinch of salt. Everybody say, that's me. Amen. You guys hanging with me tonight? Amen. Why don't we clap our hands and love him for just a moment? Amen. Amen. This is, this is treaching, praise God. And so, we are the salt of the earth. Pharaoh gave the commandment to these midwives to, to literally kill these children. And they, they, they refused. They refused. And they saved the life of a boy named Moses. God used then Moses to preserve the lives of the Hebrew children. The reason why God often uses a small group or even one individual is you simply don't need a whole lot of salt. It's potent. It's powerful. It is effective. The Bible tells us of a young man by the name of Gideon. Anybody know the story of Gideon? Gideon is a young man. He has insecurities. He has self-esteem issues, uh, like a lot of us. And he doesn't see himself as anybody special, but God chooses him. And God says, you are a mighty man of valor. And Gideon gets an army, and it's thousands of people, thousands. And God says, too big. And eventually, it's just Gideon and 300 men, and they are able to do what thousands of men could not have done because you don't need a whole lot. Amen. You are the salt of the earth. In some places, salt serves a different purpose. In some places, salt is symbolic of judgment. Now, this is very different from what we've discussed so far. We talked about how salt is an enhancer. We talked about how salt is a preservative, and those are very good things. But then we see some very different examples in the Bible of how salt is used. In Genesis 19, Lot and his family are being rescued by angels. And as they're being rescued by angels, um, Sodom and Gomorrah is being destroyed with uh, fire and brimstone. And instead of focusing on the angels that were in front of her and leading her out and saving her, Lot's wife looked backward at Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Bible says that she turned into a pillar of salt. And Lot's wife is a simple reminder that sometimes, uh, you know, I, <clears throat> there's a phrase that uh, a, while, a while ago was very popular. People were calling each other salty. Anybody hear that? <laughs> and the Bible says she turned to a pillar of salt. And Lot's wife serves as a simple reminder that the saltiest people are the ones who focus on everything behind them and nothing good in front of them. All right? And um, this is very, very important that we understand that salt in one measure can be good, but in another measure can be judgment. Another place in Scripture where salt is a form of judgment is in Judges chapter number 9, where a man by the name of Abimelech, who is the son of Gideon, he, um, he fights a battle in a city called Shechem. And after he wins that battle, he takes salt and dumps it all over the city. And he dumps so much of it. And he does this because uh, dumping that salt would effectively stop anything from growing out of the ground. It would ruin the, the soil and the balance in the soil. And things simply wouldn't grow. All right? And... That was because the people who lived in that city were a particularly heinous group of people. And they wanted to make sure that, that that city never rose again. And they sowed salt everywhere. And um, after, after he raises the city, he sows the salt. 
and it was referred to, we can refer to it as a judgment of salt. All right? And what did the salt do for Lot's wife? Well, what it did is it stopped her attitude. All right? If we look at this in a very, very <clears throat> broad sense, um, she, was, she, was, she was caught up in the past. And that salt was a judgment that, that stopped that attitude from going into the future. And man, you have to be able to discern when, when, when you are thinking in a certain way that needs to stop. And um, we have to discern what things in our life and in our homes and, our, and, and in our environment need to stop. And if there's some things or some habits in your life that need to stop, I highly encourage you to get some salt and just dump it on it. Amen. If there's some habits, uh, if there's some things on the Internet that you do, amen, if there's some uh, places you go, if maybe there's some friendships that are no longer good for you, amen, find that person. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Don't pour salt on nobody. Amen. But there are some things in your life that some times uh, are difficult, uh, amen, uh, to stop them from overtaking your future. And I commend you today, and I strongly encourage uh, that in prayer you ask God uh, to help you to, to stop those things from overtaking your future. Can you say amen? Amen. And so salt can be used to preserve, and it can be used to enhance, and it can also be used, amen, to stop some things from ruining your life. Amen. And so there's the judgment of salt. Uh, salt stop. Lot, Lot's wife's attitude from spreading. Amen. Kind of a drastic measure, but we get the, we, you get the idea. Lot, uh, salt stopped the attitude of Shechem, that, that city, from, from, from ever rising again. And uh, to now balance the scales and to go back to maybe something positive, salt is healing. Uh, in 2 Kings, Elisha visits a town where the water supply has been tainted. And so the prophet Elisha is in this town, and... The water is poisoned, basically, and if the water is poisoned, then the vegetation is poisoned. They're going to die. The people in this town are going to die because the water source is essentially as, as good as sewage. And so um, the prophet Elijah makes a very, very interesting request. He asks for a pot of salt. Now, remember, if they're poor, a pot of salt is probably the most valuable thing in town. And he takes that pot of salt and he finds the wellspring or the source of that water in that town and he dumps it in. And the Bible says that the Lord healed the water. And they were able to grow things and they were able to, to live and to prosper. Amen. We are the salt of the earth. Amen. Sometimes we wonder why, we'll, why, why we're still here and God hasn't taken us to heaven and just... Amen. Wrap this whole show up. That's because God has poured us out, has poured you out on the city of Spokane to be a, a source of healing. God has put you here in Cornerstone North, in this church, in this building, in this room right now, because you are salt in the hand of God. Amen. Can you say amen? Everybody say, that's me. That is me. Amen. You, you are the, you are the healing. You are the preservation. You are the preservative you are even at times the judgment now what do i mean by that amen but before i get to that let's continue let's talk about healing amen if you are the healing jesus said of his disciples that they would lay hands on the sick and they would recover amen i remember one time i was about uh maybe 18 or 19 and my pastor called me he said i'm sick and i said okay and he said that means i can't go to the hospital to pray for this person and he said, I need you to go. I'd never gone to the hospital and prayed for anybody. And um, it was awkward. It was, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. But I went. And I remember walking into the hospital room. Uh, the man I was praying for was, he was not a Christian. In fact, I think he was Buddhist. And I didn't know what to do. But you know what? Sometimes it's, you don't, you don't have to know what to do. You are the salt of the earth. And by virtue of what you are and who you are, healing Amen. Uh, just, just, just. You, you don't, you don't, you don't have to say, man. I'm just not qualified. You have inherent value as the salt of the earth. And I remember, I picked up my Bible. And I didn't know what to do, so I read the Bible. That's always a good thing to do when you don't know what to do. And I read Psalms 91, and I prayed, and and I left. And a few days later, the man's wife called and said, my husband is healed. 
And man, that wasn't anything special, amen, about me. But let me remind you that you have the same Holy Ghost inside of you. And you can walk into a hospital room. You can walk into a nursing home. You can walk onto a high school campus. Uh, amen, you can go anywhere, and you are the healing in that room. Amen, you can... Amen. Can somebody say amen? Anybody believe that God has called you for a purpose? Amen. Has a plan for your life. And there is inherent value on your life. Amen. And that when you walk into a room, amen, you have authority in that room over every evil spirit. Amen. Over every spirit of oppression. If you have the Holy Ghost inside of you, amen, you are the majority. Can you say amen? In the book of Acts, Peter picks up a lame man and he says, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, I give thee. And he says, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And he picks him up. And the lame man begins to leap and to dance. Uh, and later on, they're accused of turning the city upside down. Just a little bit of salt. Uh, a man can go a very, very, very long way. You know, there's another place where Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, Whatsoever you bind... On earth is bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye loose on earth is loosed in heaven. And there is a certain authority that's been given to God's people. And this goes back to the fact that as salt, in one measure, it can be healing, life, preservation. And in another measure, it can be judgment. And man, we have the ability to determine what things will move forward and what things will not even hit the ceiling. We, as God's people, can bind together and pray against spirits of oppression and depression and say, you are bound in Jesus' name. Amen. We have the authority, amen, in the spirit world to call things as they are. Amen. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood, the Bible says. We're not, we're not fighting people. We're not fighting uh, people with names. We're not fighting uh, humans. Uh, but we are fighting principalities and powers. Uh, amen. Presence, uh, darkness, uh, evil. Amen. And we need something, amen, that is going to be able to, in one measure, provide healing to those who need healing. And in another measure it is going to be able to destroy the works of the enemy amen and what that is uh, is the people of God amen we are the salts of the earth uh, amen and I'm almost through here and as we stand here tonight amen uh, together and we're going to pray in just a few moments uh, I, I what I really really want uh, amen is everybody to get a revelation let's stand together amen of who you are in the Holy Ghost amen it's easy amen to be insecure and to be scared and uh, to be intimidated uh, about all the things that are going on. But every time I, I'm reminded of what God has given us and what is at our disposal, we have no excuse. We have absolutely no excuse. You know, the thing about, the, the, the reason why people understood what Jesus was saying was because in those days... People would go to the market, and they would sell salt, and um, there were salt counterfeiters in ancient times. Obviously, this could be a very lucrative business, <laughs> um, and they would take some other random mineral that, that looked similar, and they would pulverize it until it had the, similar t the same texture as salt, and, and what they would do, they wouldn't outright sell that. They would just they would dilute the real salt with some of this nameless, tasteless, random um, mineral. And it, it would take the salt out of the salt. Amen. And um, that's how salt could lose its saltness. Because it's actually chemically and organically impossible for salt to, to lose its saltness. That's why it's such a good preservative. You can leave it on the shelf for 100 years. You come back and, if you, if you can, right? <laughs> 100 years, I want to be gone. I'm not sure if I, I want to live that long. Um, I want to go to heaven, actually. I want to be raptured, amen. But the reason why salt is salt is because you can leave it on the shelf and you can come back, we'll give it a conservative estimate, 10 years later, amen. And it's still salty. And the only way for salt to chemically lose its salt, well, it can't. That's the point. 
Salt can't lose its salt. The only way it can is for it to be diluted with a substance that is not salt. Amen. And what I'm simply preaching here today is if we are going to be the salt of the earth, let's not be a diluted mixture. Amen. Let's be the 100% real deal. And I believe I'm looking at a group of people that's gathered here on a Tuesday night. You're here because you want to be 100% Amen. Sold out for Jesus. Let's lift our hands right now. Let's begin to pray. Amen. Let's begin to pray and ask the Lord to help us. Uh, God, we're here today. God, because we, we want to take every ounce of impurity out. Uh, God, we don't want to be a 50% mixture. We don't want to be a 75%. God, we don't even want to be a 99%. Uh, but God, we want to be a 100% bona fide, uh, amen, pure mixture. We want to be the salt of the earth. Uh, help us, Lord. Help Help us, Lord. Develop us. Uh, we want to be faithful. We want to be the preservation of our families. Uh, we want to be the healing influence uh, in our city. God, we want to be the judgment on unrighteousness uh, and evil. God, we want to be able to be the force uh, that can stop the works of the devil. Amen. Cold in its tracks. Uh, we want to be the people of God. Unadulterated. Pure. Amen. Amen. Clean. White as snow. God, we want to be your church. Uh, unspotted. Unblemished. Help us, Lord. Amen. If you've been struggling with any shortcomings, amen, this is the time where we say, God, help us. Help me, Lord. I want to be the best I can be. You know why? Because somebody is counting on you being a 100% mixture. Somebody is counting on you being the salt of the earth. Your family, your children, your church, your city. Amen. God is depending on you to be the best you can be. Amen. The devil's been telling you that you're good for nothing. He's a liar. I rebuke him in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of Jesus, uh, and we're going to be worth our salt. Uh, I don't want to be that servant. Uh, amen. When the Lord comes, uh, he says, I never knew you. I want to be that servant uh, that he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Uh, enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Amen. If you believe God is going to do something in your life and through your life, uh, why don't you clap your hands and begin to say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. One more time, clap your hands uh, and give God the praise and just love him for a few moments. Uh, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That was salty. Amen. And between today and Sunday, you know what to do. Keep on walking and salting everything, and, he, and then you'll be in good shape. Already love you all. See you on Sunday, and keep on uh, doing what's right. Keep on leaving out the scripture in your life. You know, don't leave Jesus here. Take him with you every single day. All right. Amen.